Hi everybody, my name is Tom Foster and this is Sports Talk with Iris Dunham. Iris is behind the camera, she's my producer, uh, director, editor, she does it all. As a matter of fact, she's going in her senior year and wish her the best of luck. With me today is, you know, every year we start a new year just like Iris has started her new school year. And this year we're starting new with a new athletic director here at the Morgan School. And with me right now is Megan Sears. And Megan, welcome. Thank you for having now, me. Now, um, Megan, tell me a little bit about your background. What brought you here and where, where were you before? And what are some of the things we should know about you and your family? So my background, um, I grew up in Massachusetts. Oh, where about? Uh, right outside of Springfield in Longmeadow. That's where I grew up. Really? We'll have to talk about that when, yes. when we go off air. That's awesome. <laughs> okay. um, I was a three-sport athlete in high school. What I high played school? Long Meadow High School. I used to do all their games just like I'm doing yours. <laughs> it's a small <laughs> world, Megan. Small yes. world. Um, so I played field hockey. Um, I was a downhill ski racer. Wow. And I played girls lacrosse. And then I went to Springfield College afterwards, and I played field hockey and girls lacrosse at Springfield College. I right, went to AIC, so we were rivals. <laughs> Neighbors. <laughs> um, I studied physical education and health education there yep. um, and pursued my teaching career immediately after college. I started teaching at Haddam Killingworth High School. Oh, right. So that's what brought me to Connecticut. Okay. I was there for 10 years, and I taught um, health and phys ed, as well as coached field hockey and girls lacrosse there. Great. Um, last year, I had the opportunity to step in as the athletic director at Montville High School, and I oversaw athletics at both the middle school and the high school in Montville. Um, and then I actually am a resident here in Clinton, and I felt like coming back to the shoreline was, you know, my heart's always been there. Sure. Um, and it feels like home. So this opportunity opened up, and I could not turn it down, and I am thrilled to be here. So were you living in um, Clinton when you were uh, working in uh, Adam? Yes. Oh, great. So I was, I was up there for a little bit. We rented a few places, and then we purchased a property here in town about six or seven years ago. Great. And what drew you here? What, what made you want to come to Clinton? Um, so my, my grandmother was on the shoreline growing up. We'd go to Saybrook, okay. um, and I've always had a love for the shore and the, the communities around the shoreline. Um, and Clinton was a great place that I, you know, envisioned us raising our family. Um, I do have two young daughters. Oh, good. How old are your daughters? They are three years old and 10 months old. Oh, all so right. Keeping you busy. Keeping you busy. <laughs> sort of a renaissance um, person, right? Yes. So yep. I'm excited. Actually, my oldest is uh, starting with youth soccer in town this year. So oh, okay. I'm excited. It just It's such a community um, feel when you step into Clinton. I'd come from Haddam, come down, you know, go to the grocery store here, shops. Um, and I just, I love the kind of neighborhood um, feel that you get when you, you are here in town. And so. it's interesting because, you know, I've interviewed a lot of people on the show and, you know, I always ask them, what's the one thing that sticks out that reminds you of Clinton or you really like about Clinton and really makes you want to stay here? And they say people. Mm -hmm. And I think you, you definitely would be Absolutely. an advocate of that. Yep. Yeah. And I've been able to, you know, develop some really strong friendships and relationships here in town. So. so people knew you before you even got here in this job. In some ways, a few people. <laughs> but <laughs> now, I'm excited to meet more. Oh, that's great. Now, you, you were at Montfield. How does the student body at Montfield compare to the student body here in terms of numbers? So actually, they're very similar. I would say they we differ about 20 to 30 uh, students um, right over the 500 threshold uh, for both schools. So Morgan's slightly larger um, by 20 or 30 students. Are you um, in the same divisions for sports? Uh, for the most part, yes. Okay. Um, we always are kind of on that buffer between S and M, depending upon which sports and which teams. Um, mm -hmm. But for the most part, we do compete. We have a few games scheduled with Montville this year. Oh, so I had worked with the previous AD scheduling those last year. So it's nice to kind of be on the other end of it now. So they're about equal in terms of 500. What about participation in the sports? What was it in terms of the numbers of people that played sports? So um, we actually have a slightly higher participation rate here mm -hmm. in Clinton. Um, we're just over 60%. I think we're around 62%. 62 of the 500? Uh, yes. Percent okay. of students are actually involved in okay. um, athletics one way or the other mm -hmm. at various different levels. Um, in Mottville, we were in like 50, I believe it was like 50. Three or fifty? Oh no, fifty-seven percent. So we're similar, but we definitely have um, a little bit higher um, participation rate here, which means that our more students are involved. So sure, you can't complain great. about that. No, it, one of the things I found, having done sports in Long Meadow all my life and covered lacrosse <laughs> and all the sports you mentioned about, I actually did do scout a downhill skiing. Uh, I think at Berkshire East is yes, that we did the skiing at Berkshire East. Yeah. <laughs> and um, one of the things I found in dealing with the athletes and dealing with their parents is that when the kids were involved in sports, it seemed that their grades stayed pretty well. They did pretty mm -hmm. good. Whereas if they got hurt and they weren't playing sports, it seemed they sort of you know slacked off a little bit. And do you think that's because of the the, the uh, sort of the mindset that you're, when you're a sport, you got to compete, and you want to be number one, you want to win. And when you're not competing like that, do you think that does have an issue on them mentally in terms of the will to succeed? 
I definitely do think so. And I also think when you are part of a team, whether it's an individual or like a team sport, yeah. um, you kind of have that, that not necessarily feeling of belonging, but you are representing something a little bit bigger than yourself. Sure. So not only are you that individual on the court or the field, you're representing your team in the community. Um, that's something I have a conversation with our coaches about at the beginning of the year. Um, I talk to our athletes about that. You know, it's, it's one of those things to be prideful of where you're coming from and representing that community outside the walls of, you know, our town. Uh, so I definitely think that, you know, COVID, unfortunately, in the past few years have limited those opportunities. Sure. So now this really is our first year that the seniors are having a true full high school experience. Like my friend Iris. For the most part, <laughs> um, without or very limited restrictions. So we're thrilled to have, you know, students back in the building trying to roll out as normal of a school year. And we have an opportunity to really kind of capitalize on that and, um, you know, reestablish what we want the Morgan way to be. Sure. So, and it's I'm nice because you're harder. starting anew, and for most of these uh, kids that are here, they were, they're starting anew as well mm -hmm. because of COVID. And, you know, when you look at the sports programs at Montville, um, how many sports programs that you have there compared to um, the ones we have here? So we had, for the most part, pretty similar um, kind of lineup of sports. Um, we have more here. We have 27 offerings here, um, and we had 21 in uh, Montville. So we did not have field hockey, we didn't have fencing. So those are great programs really? that we're able to have here. Yeah. Um, we did have a few co-op opportunities um, with swimming, hockey, gymnastics. We just didn't have students at the time who were interested. However, we do have them here. So yeah. there definitely are a few more opportunities here as well. It was interesting when I found out that we actually had a, a fencing team here. Yes, and very successful and The first one. show Iris and I did, we did with fencing. I was shocked at how many people actually come out for fencing and the support they get. Yeah, it's a it's, wonderful program. Yeah, so it's it's nice to hear that you know, you're know you going to continue on with that tradition and uh, keep these programs going. And, and what about the split between men and women? Mm -hmm. Um, so, for the most part, the split is pretty equal. Um, both, uh, I would say, both at Montville and um, here at Morgan, um, the ratio of men is slightly higher who are or male athletes, um, but not significantly. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I would say for the most part, we have a pretty equal representation of both male and female athletes in our athletic programs here. So, in terms of Title IX, that there's no issue with Title IX. You know, explain to people what Title IX is and how you have to allocate between men and women's programs. So, That's always, um, people always hear about Title IX. Like, what's that? I will be the first to say that I'm not an expert on sure. Title IX by yeah. any means. Um, it is a very extensive and in-depth, um, but providing equal opportunities for all of our athletes. Mm -hmm. Kind of a quick snapshot, um, just in regards to male and females and opportunities in the state of Connecticut, females uh, are able to participate in all male sports. Right. Um, that is kind of leveling that playing field. There always happen to be more opportunities for males to participate in sports. And this is our way to provide opportunities for females to be able to be equally represented and provide them with those opportunities. Oh, that's great. We're, gl we're glad to hear that. And you know, another thing people ask me when they see all these sports, they see all sports equipment and they see gloves and they see footballs <laughs> and they see all this. How are the sports actually funded here in town, in, in most towns? So most towns and here in Clinton, um, all of our athletic programs are fully funded by the Board of Education. So we get the annual um, budget process. You know, we break out line items by sport, our needs, whether it be equipment, um, coaching salaries, um, dues and fees to certain associations, um, our officials, transportation, so on and so forth, uniforms. Um, so all of that is proposed to the Board of Education. So that is part of the budget that gets crafted and adopted by the town. Mm -hmm. So um, our programs are fully funded. Um, if there are items that coaches may want to purchase that are kind of above and beyond the actual needs to run the program, um, there are opportunities they can independently fundraise as a team. Um, or we also have a wonderful boosters program here and they do help support our athletic programs. Right, I know I was talking to some of the football boosters and I know they fund some of the programs and they go out and raise money. And um, so that's something they can do should they choose to do so. Yes, I would ask them obviously to you know have conversations with me, let me know. I don't know what the needs are if they don't communicate it with me. Sure. Um, if it is something that we can support as a school, I will absolutely budget for that. And should it be something that's necessary for the program that really should be um, a purchase that the school does district does make um, so you know it's it's all about the communication and having that open line of communication to be able to figure out what our needs are when you do the when you do the uh, line item itemization obviously in a sport like football there's a lot more people that are going to be playing football mm -hmm. than there would be in a say uh, the, uh, field hockey or something mm -hmm. like that so is that a line item that you have to ask for more money for that sport than you would for another sport I mean how does that work so, for example, purchasing uniforms, yeah. that's a great way to kind of look at it. Purchasing a football uniform versus maybe even like a cross-country singlet that they might wear sure. or field hockey uniform. Right. Um, 
it's going to be a significantly higher price tag. So then you try to come up with a rotation of uniforms. So, you know, you have a higher expense uniform one year, three, four years, um, the remainder of the sports kind of get divvied out to make it equal. So then it's consistent rotation. Um, it's not necessarily per pupil cost. Yep. Um, so different sports will have different needs each year. Um, sports that do supply and support more athletes typically probably will have higher um, budget um, overall costs each so, year. So, so you're passing uniforms from one class and the other class to the other class as they come through, correct? Mm -hmm. And I was always interested in that because what if you have like one class that has like everybody's an XL and um, the rest of them are small, <laughs> you know, how do you allocate that? Do our best. We're, we're not gonna <laughs> see some kids, a little tiny kid yeah. like this running around in a so, large uniform. We really do rely on the, the knowledge of our reps who we work with and collaborate okay. with. Um, they've been doing it for years and years and years. Um, they kind of have the best idea as to, okay, we need this many smalls, mediums, larges, um, and they help us kind of frame out what we think that we would need. Doesn't mean we don't have an athlete running around with maybe a little baggy uniform, <laughs> yeah, but right. um, we do our best to obviously make every athlete comfortable. I know one of the things that has become very prevalent in, in today's society, especially in football, is the safety, the mm -hmm. safety issues, Absolutely. especially with the helmets. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, so from one year to another year, you might have enhancements that have to be made to the helmets themselves because they're not up to code, so to speak. So what do you do in a situation like that? So that's actually built into our budget as well. That's okay. um, called a reconditioning cost. Mm -hmm. So um, we are able to send out our equipment that needs to be reconditioned, assessed for safety. Um, they will let us know that the company that we utilize, they'll let us know if they are able to repair things, recertify them, or even if it's, it's an item that is no longer uh, safe for our athletes to be using. Um, so sometimes those are costs that pop up if you know we have four or five helmets that we thought were going to come back as eligible helmets and no yeah. longer are. So sometimes yeah. those are accrued costs that we're you know, were anticipated originally. So it's built right into the budget process. Mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. And, and of course, you're following that. That must be one of your roles is to make sure you're constantly following those codes and making sure that you're following all the reg new regulatory changes as well. Absolutely. Every year they kind of, um, you know, provide us with a list of updated or revised um, policies or rules from the state. Um, of, of course, we have Board of Education rules and high school um, and middle school policies and rules that are pertain to school specifically that might be revised and sure. update it so um, kind of responsible for all of them <laughs> yeah and th that's interesting you know especially when you're you know working in a town so you've got the national you've got national programs you've got connecticut programs you've got uh, the, you know you got VUE you know guidelines you have your school guidelines and so that's you've got to keep a lot of balls in the air you're trying to juggle those all at the same time right <laughs> do our best so that's going to be that's going to be quite a job in and of itself isn't it it is um you know but it really breaks down to that line of communication yeah. and developing those relationships um i am very new here so right. my whole uh kind of entry plan is about establishing those relationships connecting with people meeting with them um, yeah. and really hearing out kind of the processes that currently exist that are working well. I'm not here to change anything that's working well. Right. Um, and what we can do moving forward to make things even more efficient and effective. Um, but overall, you know, it really is just establishing those lines of communication Absolutely. and relationships. And speaking of relationships, you know, one of the things, well, I, one, of, one of the things I should say is that I'm sure that one of the things that's making your transition much easier is the fact that you've got one of the best in the business in Casey Metz. Yes, Because your absolutely. assistant, it keeps you, you know, keeps you on your toes and definitely it's good from a transition standpoint because I know I've had a lot of interactions with Casey and she's phenomenal. So I'm sure you're blessed to have her with I, you. I can't tell you how many times I said I have the best resource right here with me. That's so um, she's been wonderful. I couldn't thank her enough for everything she's already done for me in this transition. Um, she is a great resource. Now, the other thing we, you know, in sort of resources, the booster clubs. Mm -hmm. Now, I know the, uh, the boys football has their own booster club called Friends of Morgan. Does every sport have a, their own booster club? So I was learning a little bit more about the history of this okay. yesterday. Um, I'm not sure how, how long ago this dates back, but sports used to have their own individual boosters. Mm -hmm. um, each sport did? Each sport did. Okay. Um, and now we have one booster program that represents all of our athletes. Oh. Um, so, you know, they have their fundraising, they gain their funds from their fundraising events, then they divvy out to all of our athletes. It doesn't matter oh. what sport they're, they're participating in, they help support um, school spirit through, you know, whiteout t-shirts or rally towels, they help with senior days. Um, they also provide scholarships for our athletes, wow, so any of our student athletes can apply for that. So that is an overarching uh, boosters pro program that supports all of our students. So, so how does the uh, Friends of Morgan, which is a booster club for um, the boys football, 
Um, so they're not covered under that umbrella of the... That is a separate entity from separate the entity. Um, boosters program that um, oversees or supports all of our student athletes. Okay. Now, obviously, you know, this, these athletes represent our town and, you know, town, that gives us a lot of pride in town. You know, these athletes are out there with our name on their shirts and representing us and representing you and our whole, all the community. Um, for those watching this program, if they want to get involved in the booster club, what would they do, Case? I mean, what would they do, Megan? So, easiest way you can reach out to me and I can connect you with our booster rep um, and booster president. She is fantastic, Katie Federico. Oh, okay. and um, Alex's mother. Yes. Okay. And she has been a great connection. I met with her a few times already in my I don't know, three weeks here. And um, she's kind of brought me up to speed about their needs and their vision of where they would like to move the boosters. Um, they're always looking for more community members and family members to join. So please, if you have any interest, reach out to me and I can connect to you guys. And um, they would love a, any support. Do you have a number they can call or the email address? Um, you can email me, M Sears, S E A R S, at clintonpublic.net, and I can bridge that connection. Perfect. That's great. And also, you can reach out to iris.dunham at clintonpublic.net, and we can also help you and guide the people in the right direction. Now, you know, we talk about athletic director, mm -hmm. and uh, people say, well, what is, what is the actual role of an athletic director? What, what, how would you define your role? Um, You've already talked a little bit yes. about balancing all these new balls in the air. <laughs> there are a lot of moving parts, yeah. um, but really, if you think about managing kind of all the facets that... Um, are included in the middle school and high school program. So that includes... Oh, so you're doing the middle school as yes. well? Wow. As well, yes. Um, well, lucky girl. <laughs> lucky woman. I feel fortunate. Um, yeah. The middle school programs that we have here are pretty ex um, extensive for middle school, which is wonderful. Um, we offer a variety of athletic programs there. Um, but, you know, when I'm looking at both middle school and high school, kind of what I do, um, I'm helping coordinate. And again, Casey is an integral part of this. Sure. Um, she streamlines all of this, but... Um, it's talking about scheduling, transportation, hiring and evaluating coaches, and just our programs in general, um, supervision and evaluation, uh, but supervision also of our events that we have here at school. So making sure that we are staffed with um, the appropriate staff, whether it be ticket takers, kind of site supervisors, um, crowd control, or kind of site wow. management yeah. per se. So, um, you know, then it's also the budget side of it, of looking at what are our program needs, what facility needs do we have. Um, and then, you know, obviously celebrating and doing things um, that honor our athletes. Um, so trying to get up to speed on all the social media stuff. Sure. It's ever changing. Yeah. Um, you know, taking care of the banners in the gym to honor our all-state athletes. Um, so there are a lot of moving pieces. Wow. Um, but how, how do you have time to do all this with raising two kids as well? You, you really have your job set out for you. <laughs> how, how many, having you a nice all? tight calendar. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> Keeping everything there. Yes. Well, we appreciate you, you know, squeezing Iris and I Thank in here. Yeah. And how do you, let's talk about different people, because you know, in order for your job to be have to run, to run smoothly, mm -hmm. you've got to interact with a bunch of people. Yes. So first of all, coaches. How do you interact with the coaches? Um, so I, there are a few different models that you can kind of follow, and I've been part of a variety of them. Um, and starting new, especially with a few weeks before season starts right. in the fall, um, my approach this year was to kind of have an all coaches meeting early on. Um, I was able to invite all of our fall, winter, and spring, both middle school and high school coaches to attend kind of a night here and give them some pizza. Said, come on, you can bribe them a little bit. Of course. Entice them. Wish um, I had known. I, I, I would have been there. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> and um, I welcomed them, was able to then meet a lot of faces that I probably wouldn't have met for months now. Um, so I didn't want to wait until the middle of the winter or even spring to meet some of our coaches. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of communication goes via email, but this is a great way to meet them in person. Um, and then I was able to provide them with um, a coaching class. Coaches are responsible for, you know, taking coaching classes throughout their okay. five years to renew a coaching permit. Um, so I was able to provide them with that opportunity to kind of expand their their learning and their knowledge as a coach as well. So that was my approach to kind of connect with as many coaches early on as I could. Did you have pretty good participation in the program? Yes. Um, well, Casey and I were sitting down and we're like, this was wonderful. We had so many people sign up. You sure so, it wasn't the pizza? Uh, it might have been the pizza. <laughs> uh, so I'll just keep, you know, throwing out pizza every time I want there you go. to come. <laughs> But yeah, we were thrilled with how many people were able to come, especially being summer still. You know, it's yeah, a tough time when sure. people are still wrapping up their summers, enjoying vacation. Um, but that that definitely was one of my approaches this year. That's great. Now, um, will you continue to work with them throughout the course of the year? I mean, we like we're going to football season and the other sports during the uh, fall season. 
So will you have meetings with them periodically throughout the course of the seasons? Yeah, a lot of communication will go through um, emails, but I've even had a few coaches reach out, hey, can I sit down and have a conversation with you? So we have meetings set up. Um, and then especially things that would pertain to the athletic department overall, mm -hmm. I'll message out to um, whether it be a specific sport or all coaches, that messaging will go out to everybody. Um, and obviously if things that are, you know, program specific come up, sometimes they'll get, oh, hey, listen, this is a new update on a certain rule or an interpretation yep. or the official assigner needs some information communicated out, I'll do that program wide. Right. Um, so it's definitely just constant communication throughout the year. Now, what about the faculty? How would you interact with, with the faculty? Now, are you teaching any courses here besides being the athletic director? So this is actually, another thing on your plate. <laughs> yeah, so this is actually one thing I meant to mention um, when you said, like, why Clinton? Yep. What drew you here? Um, after teaching for 10 years and then going into a full administrative role in Montville, I miss the interaction with the students. Sure. It was tough. I came in right as the season started. Um, and the position here was structured to have a leadership role, a leadership teacher role as well. So I will be teaching a semester course in the spring. Oh. Um, and I'll be able to interact with some of our students on a different level. So I'm very, very excited about that. And speaking of students now, what will you do in terms of engaging the students during the course of the year? So as I noted before, we have an opportunity to kind of reestablish the culture here, mm -hmm. um, which is already an amazing culture. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, bringing back um, the dog pound, I've heard that that's been an amazing, amazing thing. Okay. We want to kind of reinvent, not reinvent that. Stop but, barking back Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Bring it back, um, get more students involved, finding different ways. And this is where I kind of said, coaches, I need your input too. How can I help you? Um, because they're, you know, every single day working with the students. Um, so trying to just kind of embody that idea of let's support each other mm -hmm. um, and truly that family kind of, you know, uh, feel. So, um, you know, getting the student body involved, developing and helping students learn how to be leaders. Um, that's a tricky thing to navigate. Sure. Um, we all want to be leaders, but how do you actually be a successful leader? So developing some of those skills in our, um, some of our students is going to be kind of one of my goals this year. Yeah. Of course, <laughs> the other thing you have to concern yourself with are parents. And the town, and mm -hmm. uh, what do you? How do you, you know, plan and engage the parents and getting them involved? And you know, I imagine your phone during the during the seasons will start ringing. <laughs> how come my child didn't do this, that, or the other thing? Usually, the first thing I, if if a parent happens to be, you know, upset about something or has a question or concern, I usually just ask, Hey, have you have you had a conversation with your with your child? Mm -hmm. um, sometimes solutions and clarity comes just from that simple conversation. Um, and then, you know, touching base with coaches if need be, but also just reminding students that, um, and families that we're here to have fun, to learn and grow and develop into great humans to be able to give back to our society. Yep. Um, so sometimes our spectators and coaches and officials and admin, everybody, leaders, we all need a reminder that it, it's about kids having fun. Exactly. Um, and I heard something recently was like, if you're not winning, you're learning. So just instilling that, you know, if you're losing, you got to learn from your losses exactly. as well. Exactly. Um, so, well, you know, sometimes attitude. we need some just frequent reminders. Exactly. <laughs> Try exactly. to keep it as positive as we can. It's all about positivity and keeping yes. the, keeping the children and the athletes, you know, <laughs> front of mind. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the other thing is, you know, you mentioned the board of ed. Um, you know, all this is funded through the board of education. How involved will you be in the uh, actual um, process developing the uh, budget? So, with the building administration here at the high school and the middle school, I'll be part of. It's a collaborative process. Yep. Um, I will work with them, propose kind of my ideas um, together. Then we will craft what the middle school and the high school and really the athletic budget in general, mm -hmm. what that will look um, like. And then I will be in conversations with um, the superintendent, Mary Ann, as well. Sure. And that really is with that building administration and myself. Um, so is that independent of Carrie, what she's doing for the overall uh, school budget? So typically, um, the athletic budget will be built into the school budget as well. So you work with Carrie as part of that yes. process to make sure it's all integrated mm -hmm. before you go to Marianne. Yes. Okay. And of course, uh, Marco is an awesome human being as well. Mm -hmm. he's, def he's definitely a mover and shaker. He's, yes, he's and I hear he's a big a, supporter of us Huskies. He, he absolutely <laughs> is. He absolutely is. You'll see him at all the games without yes. question. Now, you know, as you start a new job, you know, they always say there's a new president and uh, or a new administrator or whatever the case might be, and they always want to set a short-term goal. like. You know, you say the president, what are you going to do in your first 100 days? What's your first goal that you'd like to accomplish? The first thing you say, you know what, I've sort of, I haven't had much time, but I've sort of assessed the situation. Here's what I'd like to do in the mm -hmm. next, let's say, next two or three months. What would that be? So something that I think could be immediately kind of brought back, it's not, not a new idea, um, but COVID really has 
unfortunately taken away opportunities um, is to kind of reinvigorate and bring back the unified sports program. Um, I know that, you know, there is always great interest for that. Um, and what do you mean by the unified sports program? So unified sports is offered across statewide. Um, it's in partner with Special Olympics. And so student athletes um, or students, I should say, in the school as well as um, a variety of students with disabilities can work and collaborate together and nice. participate in athletics. Um, and it is one of those things that every event you go to, you can't walk away without having this huge smile on your face. Sure. Um, so it's providing opportunities for every student in our, our, in our building. So oh, um, the Shoreline itself has some different events that they do. The state hosts some tournaments and different events as well. So getting more involved with some of those um, tournaments, whether it be a bowling tournament, a volleyball, a soccer, basketball, track and field, they have done um, kind of like a backyard or lawn games tournament. So no, that's I, nice. I was involved with that when I was a teacher. Um, so I'm hoping to kind of bring some of those ideas here and um, not reinvent anything, but just join in on some of the events that currently exist. And I think that's something that the, the community should become involved with and understand. Mm -hmm. And again, if they want information about this, same same number, same email. Yes, absolutely. Okay. So I think that's very important. I, I like that idea, and I think it's important that all people have the opportunity to participate in sports, regardless of what it is, absolutely. and regardless of the skill levels. Everybody has the right to participate, and I think that people that, that uh, you know in that situation, they have the right to compete just like anybody else. Mm -hmm. and I think that's awesome. So congratulations. I hope you, that gets fulfilled in your first hundred days. Yes, thank you. And then, so after the hundred days, now you got the long term goals. When you set goals for yourself. Um, Megan, are you doing it for a year, two years, three years? How, how far out do you actually try to set you know, your goals for the, what you're going to do in the athletic department both here and the middle school? So I think I'm right now where I currently stand is I'm kind of looking at where I am right now. I'm in the assessment kind right. of phase, right. taking in everything. Right. Um, and then I kind of need to break it down into, you know, two, three, and then kind of almost think about a five-year plan. Mm -hmm. um, but truly, right now, I can't say that I have everything to be able to determine what I want to do sure. in five years Absolutely. from now. You're still in the assessment process. Yes. Yeah. yeah, I'm collecting everything. But um, really, it's kind of like the wants and the needs. So, and then prioritizing, what are the biggest needs? Um, are there structural needs? Like, do we need actual equipment or different things to help our programs actually function at the peak performance that they could? Um, or are these more kind of wants and desires? Um, so it's a lot of, I think right now, what I would be focusing on is the um, kind of culture, the communication, the leadership side of it. Sure. You know, you don't need funding for that kind of stuff. Um, and it's just, that's, you know, tying into the, the teachers and the resources we have here in the building, the administration, and then the community too. So bridging that um, relationship with the community as well. That's great. And you know, it's been, because uh, I'm on the board of trustees of a, well, AIC, mm -hmm. and we just hired a new president. And he's in the same situation you are. He came in and <laughs> now he's in the assessment phase and we're trying, what are you gonna do in the first 100 days? Yeah. What are you gonna do here? And, uh, but you're in that phase where it's sort of a good news, bad news, because what's happened in the past is gone, and now you have a, the opportunity to look at the future and develop it yourself and see what it is, see what you have, and then formulate your own opinions and your own goals, and I think that's great. Mm -hmm. And it's got to you know, make you happy to know that you've got a fresh start, mm -hmm. and you've got all these assets available to you, and it's just a matter of understanding what they are and how to effectively utilize them and put them into action. That's great. Yeah, and the end of the year will be the biggest um, kind of time where I'll be able to say, okay, I've lived through a year here now, you know, I'm not here to make waves year one. Let's, let's figure out, you know, what really is working and where are the areas that we need to kind of focus on for improvement, not necessarily change, but improvement. Sure. And you know, the final question I have for you is, what do you think is the one thing that clearly defines you as a person, as a leader? I don't mean to put you on the spot, but, you know, <laughs> <laughs> but what would you say that defines you as a person? Obviously, you're a very structured person. Obviously, you're a very caring person. Obviously, you know, you can, you know, juggle a lot of balls at the same time, but what clearly defines you? It is hard to kind of identify like one thing. I, something I would say is definitely caring. I'm passionate about what I do. Um, I truly care about all of our students. Um, I want what's best for them. Um, and I try to be a role model in that regards of, you know, if, if you have this dream, chase it. You know, but think about the little obstacles and little challenges you may face, but then, you know, view them as opportunities to grow and learn. Um, I would say, especially being new, you know, somebody might not seem approachable because they're brand new. Right. But um, my ability to, you know, eventually develop those relationships, connect with people, and then they do see that caring side about me. They see that I truly am here for the kids. It's, it's not about me. Right. <laughs> um, so I would say, you know, really being able to develop those relationships and, you know, make those connections and establish those um, really 
foundational elements and it goes back to one of my biggest values and beliefs as a person, as a teacher, as a coach, as an admin and as a leader um, is the, the whole premises of respect. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you respect, you have to first of all have respect for yourself, um, for others, your teammates, officials, fans, equipment, but, um, you know, your opponents as well. So, you know, respect is one of my foundational elements. And I think that if I can somehow kind of admit that onto everybody and hopefully they can, um, learn from that as well. As a matter of fact, one of my teachers once told me, uh, to thine own self be true, mm -hmm. you know, because at the end of the day, when you look at that mirror, there's one person you can't fool and that's the person you yeah. look at the mirror. <laughs> So it's respect question. for yourself, respect for the people around you, respect for your job, and respect for the institution that you work for. So I think that's a great foundation. And, and, you know, just talking to you for a short period of time, I can see that uh, I think you're going to be a huge success here at Morgan. We hope Thank to stay you. around for a long time. And uh, I, I wish you the it. best of luck. And uh, you. wish your family the best of luck. And, again, uh, you're an outstanding human being who's juggling a lot of balls at the same time. <laughs> and uh, you're a true Renaissance person. And uh, I thank you so much for taking the time and uh, anything I can do in terms of, you know, getting the word out through, through uh, Iris and myself and any shows you want to do, let us know because Absolutely. we're all about letting the community know what we're doing here at Morgan and what we're doing in the community. And uh, that's why we hope things like this will make it a better place to be. And certainly you're going to help uh, in that cause and make it a great place for Clinton. And uh, again, I thank you for your positivity, your compassion, and it, and it shows. <laughs> thank okay. you. So ladies and gentlemen, that wraps up tonight's show. My name is Tom Foster, along with Iris Dunn, and thank you for watching tonight's show with our new athletic director, Megan Sears, and we hope you reach out to her if you have any ideas or comments. Uh, as you can see, she's, she's uh, got a lot of good ideas, and it's, let's make these good ideas come to fruition, and with your help, we can make it happen. So thank you very much, and we'll see you again in another upcoming show. Good night, everyone.